Hi, everybody. This is Gino Vanelli. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the persons appearing on the program. Today on Rainbow Country, queer comedy with a spotlight on Second City's very own Shohana Sharman. That and more in episode 399. So stay tuned for Gay Talk Radio right here on Rainbow Country. Hi, this is Emily Saliers from Indigo Girls. Hey everyone, this is Chris Harder, porn star, burlesque performer, and the creator of Porn to Be a Star. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. Well, hello and welcome to a brand new journey through Rainbow Country. As I like to call it, a little gay radio show working to give voice to the LGBT community and beyond. And as always, I am your tour guide through Rainbow Country. I'm producer and host, Mark Tara. By the way, Rainbow Country originates from CIUT FM in Toronto and now proudly in syndication on 12 outlets across Canada from coast to coast to coast. The Yukon, British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, the east coast of Canada in Newfoundland, Ontario, even down to Buffalo, New York, and online. Well, thanks to you tuning in, streaming, downloading, but ultimately listening. Together, we continue to build Rainbow Country into a nationally syndicated gay radio show, a number one LGBT podcast on Podomatic.com's Gay and Lesbian Chart, as well as being recognized as a number one Canadian LGBT podcast on Feedspot.com. So today, she is a comedian, a writer, a theater artist. She's also part of Second City's touring company. She's a proud Muslim, a woman of color. She's also queer. She is Shohana Sharman, and she's my guest today to talk all about, all about her. We'll get a glimpse into just what Shohana Sharman is all about. Plus an hour two, music from LGBT artists, independent artists, voices that we've come to know and love in classic disco, classic 80s, classic house. And on this episode, I'm featuring some, some new wave, some queer jazz, and more. All that lies ahead as we start Journey 399 through Rainbow Country. But first up, the most recent evicted house guest from Big Brother Canada, season 12. House guests, I have the results. By a vote of 9 nil. Dennis, you have been evicted from the Big Brother Canada house. Please get your things and say your goodbyes. Group hug. Give me a hug. Love you, Dan Dan. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. You're a star. You're a star. I had a very good time. Dennis, hi. How are you? <laughs> good. How are you? <laughs> I I am good. How are you doing today, Dennis? <laughs> um, I have not touched social media because uh, my partner has said, and and people have told me or impressed upon me the overwhelming support apparently that I'm getting, and I'm. It almost makes me want to cry. Like I'm not. I'm not ready for that. Plus leaving, um, it kind of makes it easier knowing that there's all that love. But it, it, it has been a uh, 
roller coaster of emotions, let me just say. <laughs> so, Dennis, let's talk about that vote. Unanimous, yeah. nine, zero. Yep. Did that vote surprise you? Not at all. Uh, I almost take it as a badge of honor to have nine to zero. Like everyone just, Dennis was a threat. Dennis was a threat. I love that. Uh, Todd wanted to give me a sympathy vote. And I said, please don't. This will, you're playing the middle. Keep it at the middle. Um, it did not surprise me. I went around campaigning and then I told everyone, because I'm very direct and I uh, put in the effort. I'm, uh, what's the opposite of someone not wanting to do something? Um, I'm very proactive. So I went around the house with a pre-pitch, with a pitch, and then a follow-up pitch. And in that follow-up pitch, I basically said, are you going to give me the vote or not to certain people? And they said no. And then I switched my tactic. And uh, the linchpin, Anthony, I asked him if something would be interesting and appealing to him, my votes and my uh, commitment to him. And he was not interested. So I knew I knew my game was done. Um, it was not a surprise. So Dennis, you, like myself... We are both part of the LGBT community. There were a few of you in the house on season 12. Did you want to work with fellow uh, queer members to maybe have an alliance? Was there anything like that in the works? Uh, Day one, uh, I think uh, I sussed out Avery and I think she sussed out me. I can't remember the sequence, but... We sat on the stairs and said, oh, it's so cool. Uh, you're gay, I'm gay. Let's do something here. Uh, and we called it the Querios. And it wasn't an alliance. It was just an understanding. Let's have each other's back. And then we found out that Bailey uh, was queer as well and then sort of chatted her briefly. And my thought was to go in and align with uh, other queer peoples because uh, that was important to me. I wanted a team of queer people to be united and work towards the end. Uh, I thought that would be very important. I thought that would be good, quote unquote, good TV. Uh, yeah, I, I really wanted us represented. And it's it was so nice to be in that house to have a cisgender uh, queer man, a cisgender uh, uh, queer female, and then a bisexual woman. It was It was beautiful. <sighs> So let's talk some gameplay. Anth- yes. Anthon, both Anthony and Victoria, both returning uh, house guests. Yep. Did playing with returning house guests, do you think that that ultimately hurt your game? 100%. 100%. Uh, if I went in with just a cast of regulars, quote unquote regulars, this, I think my gaming would have been more uh impressed upon like uh people would have responded i would have understood people more because they wouldn't understand the dynamics of the game and as a super fan i kind of understood some of the dynamics but anthony and victoria came in with all the experience that they had on their seasons and brought that into this game the mistakes that they made they corrected uh the strengths that they had they it was even more uh stronger this time around and yes, it was completely difficult. And especially because of the way the uh, entourage system worked, they were in positions of power right off the bat. Um, I'm sure the fans are saying, because Dennis as a fan would say, this is unfair. Uh, and I'm sure the fans out there are saying the same thing. And in the house, it was difficult to navigate around that because you weren't sure if they were working together, if they weren't, if there was going to be more power given to them, if safety was, it, it was a completely different Big Brother Canada game. Your time in the house, did you think that Anthony and Victoria were working together, either uh, out openly or maybe behind the scenes? Did you think that they may have been working together? At different points, I imagined that they were working together. I can't believe that maybe there wasn't even pre-gaming. I can't believe that. As a fan, I can't not believe that they pre-gamed. Uh, I'm not privy to everything that goes on to the house. There had to be conversations. There was a moment, though, that when Victoria was HOH, she said, I wished our, and I had veto, I wish our positions were reversed, meaning she wanted me to be HOH to put up someone like Anthony. And that both inspired me and confused me. Okay, so you do want him out. 
but you can't do it yourself. What does that mean? What? And I kept asking, what does that mean? And I tried to develop a relationship with V, but her energy just was off a lot. Uh, I know she's genuine. I know she is spicy V, but her energies were off. So that just kept a lot of doubt in my mind as well as to where her true allegiances would have been. You were backstabbed by your number one, Vivek. Yep. Ultimately, why do you think Vivek backstabbed you? Um, I think Vivek is very impressionable. I think I gave him tools. I mentored him. I gave him a way of thinking of this game. He was spiraling, uh, and I took time to get to know him and take him out of his head. And then I started talking to him about the game at a different level. Uh, because he was playing too hard. And I think he just used those tools a little too impulsively. And I believe someone got it into his ear the, just with a golden tongue uh, and and gave him things that he needed to hear, given the to- context that he's an impressionable person. Who do you think got into Vivek's ear? I believe... Anthony got into his ear. I don't know who got into Anthony's ear, but Anthony eventually got into Vivek's ear. You campaigned your butt off. Ultimately, why do you think your house guests didn't pick up what you were putting down? The, The shade here is that house is full of minions. Uh, I think the three people, the first three people who have left saw the game, saw who was controlling that game, saw the gameplay, and that's ultimately why the three of us are gone. And what you have left in the house are a lot of minions. Impressionable minions. Toughest part about playing Big Brother Canada 12? Um... Looking someone in the eye and trusting them. Because at any point, anyone could be lying. And you go into conversations believing that person's telling the truth. And you just have to be open and register body language or cues to see if they're lying. Uh, And that was the read on people is difficult. You could do it. But as the game goes on and, and lies become almost truths, it becomes difficult to read people. Dennis, here's my last question for you. Best part about playing yes. Big Brother Canada season 12. Best part, that it took me 10 years to get here. And I finally I finally got to play a game that I absolutely love. The entire journey has been my favorite thing. I would be the last one to leave competitions, and I would just look at my surroundings and breathe it in and take it in. This entire journey has been wonderful. Dennis, well said, well done, well played. Thanks for your time. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you very much. And hey, Eric, queer people. Big Brother Canada Season 12 airs on Global TV. Sundays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays. For more information, simply visit bigbrothercanada.ca. When I return, queer comedy with a spotlight on Shohana Sharman. Hi, this is Amanda Marshall, and you're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. Shohana Sharman, hi, how are you? Hi, I'm doing great. How are you? I am well, I am well. I have to say thank you for being here, to have your voice, your story be heard by the by the LGBT community and beyond. So thank you for that. First of all, am I saying your your name correctly? Shohana Sharman? Yes, Shohana Sharman. That is perfect. <laughs> and thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Oh, you're you're more than welcome. You're more than welcome. I I'm sure as as this interview goes on, I'm going to butcher your name. So please forgive me in advance because I am not great with names. You are you are uh, a comedian. You are a writer, a theater artist. You are part of the 
the LGBT community. You are also part of Second City's National Touring Company. I want to start there. Second City, a legendary, iconic uh, comedy platform. Uh, how did you end up uh, getting onto the National Touring Company? Talk to me about that. Did you have to audition? How did you end up getting this gig? Yeah, so um, it's a long story and funny enough. I got some time. (laughs) (laughs) Great. Well, Second City kind of uh, really started my comedy journey. So um, I started doing comedy in 2014, and I actually started via taking improv classes at the Second City um, in the spring of 2014. I signed up for an improv class on a whim after seeing an improv show in Chicago, actually seeing a Second City show in Chicago. I loved it so much that when I came back to Toronto, I looked up improv in Toronto and lo and behold, there's a Second City Toronto. So I signed up for a class there in the spring of 2014, instantly fell in love with um, the craft of improv and the joy of it, uh, was just absolutely hooked. So I kept taking classes and, And years later, I am now in the Second City's National Touring Company. Um, I was understudying for the touring company in the spring of 2022. So March, April 2022. Uh, And then I was was eventually very uh, honored to take a full-time ensemble member position. So that's where I've been for where I've been working for the past two years. Uh, The touring company despite our name is not touring a whole bunch right now due to COVID, but we have weekly shows in our Toronto location at one York. Uh, So we do right now we're doing three shows every weekend. Um, Currently we are performing a dating and love themed show called the second city swipes, right back on the apps. Um, It's all about love and sex and all that good stuff. So yeah, it's been very, very fun. It's been a joyous journey and yeah, I, I have nothing but great things to say about all of that. So comedy, stand-up, improv, how do you see all these things? Are they all the same thing? Are they different? How do you consider yourself? Do you consider yourself a comedian? Do you consider yourself a stand-up comic? Uh, Someone, an actor who does improv? How do you see yourself, especially when it comes to comedy? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, what's interesting is that I've found the labels for me have really evolved a lot over the years. Um, I started in improv and I dabbled in stand up uh, for a couple years in the middle. I would not call myself a stand up comic now. <laughs> there was a point that I, I did do stand up for a bit. But yeah, the the beautiful thing about the label of comedy is that it can mean a lot of different things. So there's improv comedy, there's sketch comedy, there's stand-up comedy, there's comedy writing, there's just, it's such a wide umbrella. Um, So I have been very lucky to have been able to dabble in a lot of that. So um, again, like I said, I've done, I started with improv comedy. Uh, I did stand up for a bit right now at Second City. I'm primarily doing sketch comedy and my background um, outside of Second City is also primarily sketch comedy. So I was in an award-winning troupe called Not Oasis that performed um, sketch uh, at sketch and sketch festivals uh, all across North America. I also created a sketch comedy show called Dead Parent Society. That is uh, a sketch comedy show about grief, um, which is also an award-winning show. So I have been very lucky in my journey to experience different kinds of comedy. I would say that I am a comedian first and um, writer and actor second, I love writing. I love acting. I enjoy all of those things. But for me, my core has always been drawn to making people laugh. I love, (laughs) what a a thing to say. I love to laugh. Um, I love to laugh and I love to make people laugh. So that is the, that is always at uh, the center of everything I do. Mm, Well said, well said. Dear Shohana, it's me, Shohana. This is, uh, I believe, your one-person show, uh, a 30-minute show. Talk to me about this one-person 30-minute show. What's the show all about? 
Uh, yeah, so it's actually, <laughs> it's called, it's a very confusing title. It's called Dear Shoshana, It's Me, Shohana. Um, <laughs> I told you I'd butcher re- your name. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine, it's fine. No, no, no. The title is meant to be confusing, believe me. Uh, it's not a good marketing move on my part, but it's a title that I, that I, uh, it feels very true to me, so that's why I went with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the show is called Dear Shoshana, It's Me, Shohana. Um, the... Impetus behind the show is that my name, Shohana, has always been a, it has always felt like a challenge for me. Um, so when I was in, uh, my dad made up the name Shohana. It's not a real name, quote unquote, a real name. Uh, in I'm originally born and raised in Bangladesh. And in Bengali, there is no word or name that is Shohana. He took a Hindi word from India called Suhana and he changed it a little bit to make it Shohana. So the name Suhana means like beautiful, elegant, uh, lovely, all of those things. But the name Shohana is just like a butchered version of that. <laughs> um, so my whole life I've had this name that like no one really knows what it means or what it like how to say it like even in Bangladesh um in elementary school all my friends growing up were like Shohana that doesn't make sense it should be Suhana right I'm like well it should be a lot of things but it is Shohana (laughs) like uh, he named me what he named me and um then when I moved to North America in my teens um again everyone around me really struggled with the name Shohana because it's not a common name here and what I found in um moving to this side of the world is that I would constantly be called Shoshana because it's I think a more common name here uh so I every time I would get introduced or I'd meet someone they would say oh Shoshana what a beautiful name and I'd be like it's actually not it's Shohana (laughs) and that correction of always ha- someone being like, oh, it's so beautiful. And me being like, it's not, it's a worse version of it. Uh, it became a bit of a complex where I created this um, story in my head that Shoshana is the person that everyone is hoping to meet, but Shohana is the person that's actually present in the room. It just so like, I don't know. I don't know why I created this, uh, this complex in my head of like, Shoshana is beautiful, elegant, lovely, perfect. She's so confident. She's so charming. She's all of these great things. She's effortlessly cool. And then Shohana shows up in the room and she is none of those things. Shohana is a bag of anxiety. She is very socially and sexually not confident. She's just a bit of a mess trying to hold it together. Um, So my whole life, I've kind of felt like I've been navigating these two, two personalities almost. Um, And so through this uh, 30 minute sketch show, I wanted those two personnel. I wanted to really meet my best self and my worst self. Uh, So the title is Dear Shoshana, It's Me, Shohana. And in the show, you will get to meet Shoshana, who is like my ideal self. And then you get to meet Shohana, who is the actual me, but then you also get to meet some other versions of myself. So Shoshana isn't the only mispronunciation I've heard. Um, people have called me Shauna, Shobana. One person called me Selena one time, and I was like, you're not even trying. Um, so in this show, I really wanted to explore all of these different sort of characters that I found in my head just through mispronunciations of my name. Because every time someone mispronounces my name, I do sort of think like names are so important. Your identity is so rooted in your name. And I do believe like, like (laughs) I think your name can kind of shape your personality. I don't know if that's actually true for others, but I think that is true for me. Um, So I think for me, Someone named Shobana is a completely different person from someone named Shoshana or Shana. And so I wanted to explore these different characters that all have a little bit of me, but that are all sort of different versions of myself through this 30 minute sketch show. Mm -hmm. Have you always been funny? Did you grow up (laughs) being the funny one in your family? Um, I don't know if I grew up being the funny one. I have an older brother and he and I, uh, were very close growing up and are still very close. Uh, and he, 
I think we kind of developed our sense of humor in tandem, but I think the big, there was always like this challenge. I think maybe that's common with a lot of siblings of like, who can, who can make the other laugh a lot or like who can win at being the funniest. Um, And my brother is four years older than me. He, you know, when we were kids, he was much taller, much bigger, much stronger. Like he could beat me at everything else, like every sport, every competition he would beat me at. But the one thing I could beat him at was being uh, witty and funny. Uh, So, yeah, I think, I think that's where it started. And I think like some of my best childhood memories are like literally rolling on the ground, laughing with my brother over some stupid thing one of us said. Uh, So I don't know if I've always been funny, but I've always wanted to make people laugh. And on that note, Rainbow Country will return right after this. I'm Billy Newton Davis, and we're sitting here on Rainbow Country with the fabulous Mark Tara. Hi, my name is Joanne Vanicola, and I'm an actor and a writer, and I was first on Rainbow Country with Mark Tara on discussing the massacre at Pulse Club in, in Orlando. Um, I realized how important it was for our community to have a radio station uh, specifically for our issues to to talk about people in in the LGBTQ community and to provide an outlet for our stories, um, to discuss uh, our politics, culture, and give voice to the the issues that matter to us. And of course our artists and and, um, the things that we do globally and and to talk about culture and without people like Mark Tara uh, providing a space for this with, with a radio show like this then uh, we wouldn't have that voice so support tune in thank you hi I'm Eric Radford Olympic and world champion figure skater pianist and composer and you're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara so Shohana, uh, th- this next this next uh, segment, I hope we can have like a, getting to know you a little bit better and and going a little deeper. So I hope you you're you'll go here with me. So for for me, I'm I'm gay. I uh, grew up Pentecostal. Uh, I stopped going to church when I was ten, and. Today, I would consider myself uh, spiritual. I believe in I believe in a higher power. I believe that you know everyone and everything is is God is connected, and we don't necessarily need to go to you know say a building per se to you know connect with mm-hmm. you, you know your higher self, a higher power. That's that sort of thing. Y- you are you are Muslim. You are also mm-hmm. part of the LGBT. Uh, community. Do you mm-hmm. do you consider yourself a religious person or a spiritual person? Uh, I think I definitely consider myself a spiritual person. I will say I grew up uh, in a fairly religious um, context. So as I mentioned, I, I was born and raised in Bangladesh, which is a Muslim country. And my uh, family was, uh, wasn't his Muslim. My mother was a very religious woman. Uh, and as a kid, I was quite religious. I used to pray, uh, you know, five times a day. I, you know, have read the Quran twice. I knew all of the, um, all of the surahs and chants and whatever else. Uh, yeah. So I grew up quite religious and as an adult or even as an adolescent sort of navigating the different sides of myself. So, you know, coming to terms with my with my queerness and understanding that my queerness maybe did not sit in the same Venn diagram with my religious background like it 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 took time to make peace with that and it is something that I am am still making peace with I think I will continue to make peace with for the rest of my life I will say that again because of the I think religion for me was such a big cultural part of my childhood because again growing up in a Muslim country doing all of the 
religious um, festivals or um, uh, celebrations, gatherings, all of those things were really like weaved into my uh, family and my upbringing. So I, I consider myself a cultural Muslim. Like I'm not, I'm not a good Muslim. I will say that right now. Listen, I, I've eaten pork. I have drank. I have done. Do you like bacon? Oh, I used to love bacon. Yes. You used to. Oh no. You know, I, I, I have had to say, uh, I, I, I'm not eating as much bacon in my thirties as I did in my twenties, but um yeah I, I i i won't say that i'm a good muslim but i think for me uh like uh the cultural um tenets of islam are still very important to me in my mm-hmm. family life mm-hmm. and i think again like not to say i don't know people have lots of opinions on the organized religion mm-hmm. i'm not going to push organized religion on anyone mm-hmm. however i do believe that the basic principles of islam that i was raised with which was um be good to yourself and be good to those around you be kind treat everyone the way you want to be treated like i think those principles stay the same across every religion every belief every spiritual mm, journey so i don't feel like i have to compromise anything um when i say that i am a queer muslim woman Mm -hmm. like i feel like i can still hold both sides of that um in myself and be be okay mm-hmm. so so I, I mentioned you're part of the lgbt community you, you are a, a queer uh person a queer woman talk to me about your queerness and how it identifies you does it refer to your sexuality does it for, refer to how you your political views talk to me about that aspect of yourself like are you do you consider yourself gay lesbian bisexual pansexual or all of the above or or, or what have <laughs> you how how does queer represent you yeah you know what's wonderful is that i've used all of those labels at one point or another mm. <laughs> and right now just stick to queer so um i i think Initially, in my teens, I, uh, I don't know, what's the word? I don't, I didn't discover it. I think I just like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what, I never know what word to use. But um, in my teens, I uh, came out as bisexual. Um, mm-hmm. I have always been and will always be attracted to uh, uh, every gender. Uh, in mm-hmm. my 20s I learned more like I think I was in my teens what like in the early 2000s when terms like pansexual and queer were not very common at least Mm. in the context that I was growing up Mm. in so Mm. it was like gay lesbian bisexual pick Mm. one and I was Mm. like well I don't I know I'm not a gay man and I don't think I'm a lesbian so I guess I'm the third by default um kind of fell into bisexual uh, by default. And then in my 20s, when I learned more about the different terms that exist, so uh, queer, pansexual, asexual, you know, all of the different, um, uh, again, the the different terms, um, I felt that I identified more with as a pansexual. Um, I think right now where I'm at is I, I work in a theater in Toronto. So the second city is based in Toronto, but the name of that theater brings in people from all around um, the GTA and from all all across Canada and sometimes from the U S and in to that audience saying pansexual um, doesn't mean anything to them. Like (laughs) You're attracted to pans? Like a non-stick pan? Like, what are you talking about, girl? (laughs) Yeah, so it's not an accessible term for that audience. And so for that audience, I will sometimes say bisexual Mm -hmm. or queer. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, again, it's it's an evolving journey. Like, I do feel, I do feel most comfortable with the, with the term queer right now. But again, that changes. Like, that, like, Two years ago, I was like, oh, I don't really like queer. I like saying gay. Like, I think I'm gay. I like saying gay. And then that kind of changed queer. And like, who knows what I'll use two years from now. I think part of the beauty of, 
you know, queerness is that we get to be who we want to be as we evolve as humans. And there's that, that freedom is, is the beauty of it. Mm. So like I said, I am not what I'm about to talk to. I am not an expert on. Okay. So, so I, I just need to say that, but okay. So, Islam literally means submission in Arabic, uh, referring to submission to God. Muslim, one who practices Islam, again, submitting to God. Most uh, Islamic scholars are in agreement that homosexuality is incompatible with Islamic theology. So for your... So for yourself, how do you, and again, like, you know, it's the same thing in the Christian world, right? How do you come to terms with uh, who you are and, and religion? How do you, how do you sort those things out for yourself in your mind when it comes to you and your relationship with who you are and religion? Yeah, I think um, my first thought is that who I am does not change based on labels of any any of the above labels, right? Like who I am stays who I am. Um, whether I, it's it's uh, there are we as humans are mosaics of the stories that the people, the context, the places, the things that we have experienced. And I believe it is possible to hold multitudes, to have complexities, to have different parts of yourself that maybe don't fit together to the outside world, but in yourself, they make sense. So in myself, being a queer Muslim makes sense because there are parts of, there are parts of, I mean, again, in every religion, you said Christianity as well. Catholics do not um, accept uh, queerness, of course. It There is no, um, I don't, what am I trying to say here? I don't have to own all of, uh, all of Islam. It's not my responsibility. I'm one human being. It's not on me, right? Um, I can own the parts of it that, make sense for my existence who i am will be who i am regardless of what labels people put on me i will not change i will hold the parts of myself that make sense so for me being a having been raised in a muslim family and being a muslim woman with a muslim family and still being a queer woman it they i understand that to people that may seem incongruous to me it doesn't because it is who i am it, it, it is just who I am, so I can't really say that. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't know how to um, parse it apart more than that. For for me, going to church and you know, like God made you in in His image and He loves you, but you're gay and you're a sinner, and I'm like, okay. And so for me, that's why I I don't necessarily subscribe to organized religion, right? But the kernel of, I think, what's there is that there is something greater than us. Mm -hmm. Whatever that might be. You know, call it whatever the heck you want to call it. And so, for me, that's why I, you know, left the church. But Mm -hmm. I'm still a a spiritual, you know, person at heart. And at the the core of who I am. For yourself, do you see yourself moving away from, you know, the more reli- the more organized religious aspect of things for yourself? The older you become, the more you get to know yourself. Do you see that happening with yourself at all? Yeah, I would argue I already have moved away from organized mm, religion. Okay. Um again, calling myself Muslim does not mean that that, like i i think it can mean what what um, what am i trying to say i would say that i am again a cultural muslim and i've joked before about being a bad muslim like i am not 
I am not saying that I'm the perfect Muslim, but I also don't think anyone has to be. The basic tenets that Islam taught me and the meaning that Islam has in my family context and my cultural context, that stays and will stay important to me, regardless of anything else. So this organized religion conversation, like it's not really relevant to me because for me, it's more about my family and my culture than anything else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you find that you use your, your, your art and your comedy and that comes from a queer perspective for yourself? Like, do you talk about being, you know, a queer uh, Muslim person in your comedy? Yes, um, I have written a, a solo show called Come Here Often that I performed at Buddies in Bad Times Theater in what year was it? Oh my gosh, in 2022? Yeah, in 2022. Um, that where I explore, again, all of the different parts of myself that we're talking about here. So being Muslim, being queer, being, being a, you know, not skinny person. Like there are a lot of different labels that have been put on me over the years. And you can stick as many badges you want on me. It won't change who I am. I will be who I am and I will carry all of those labels and I will juggle them all and make sense of them in the best way that I can. In 2020, you uh, you were the recipient of the Queer Emerging Artist Award at Buddies in Bad Times. You just mentioned it, the, the theater. And you received that award in 2020, the Queer Emerging Artist Award. What did receiving that award, what did that mean to you? Um, it was a, I mean, it's one of my greatest honors and accomplishments. I think I'm uh i think as a as a south asian woman as a muslim woman uh coming to terms with my queerness has been a lifelong journey and will continue to be a lifelong journey and i've often felt that people who look like me do not belong in in queer spaces we do not always feel welcome in queer spaces because we are asked to, I don't know. I, th I think I've said before, like I don't really hang out in the village very much. Uh, like unless I'm with a lot of people because it doesn't always feel like, I don't know. It, it's not always uh, queer spaces have not been as welcoming to um, fam South Asian women as, as, uh, as I thought they would be. So I think for me, having the sort of, I, I hate to use the word acknowledgement, but the acknowledgement of a, a South Asian Muslim woman being a queer, being acknowledged as a queer emerging artist, I think is meaningful and important. It's important to show that queerness can come in every color, size, shape, form, everything. Mm. Have you found it challenging being a, a South Asian queer Muslim woman in comedy? Has that been a challenge for you? Yes. Uh, uh, yes. Yes, absolutely. I think um, comedy, as we know, is very male dominated, very, uh, very, very, very white spaces. And so every time I've walked into a room, I think I've done this my whole life, but I've really done this in comedy a lot. Every time I walk into a room, I do an immediate count of, is there anyone else here who's a non-white person? Usually, if I'm lucky, there's at least one else, one other uh, non-white person. Then I go, okay, cool. Is there anyone here who's a, not, who's, a, who's a queer person? Again, if I'm lucky, there's at least one other one. Often there isn't, though. And then you go down the list of like, is there a Muslim? Person? Oh, definitely not a Muslim person. Okay. So like that counting is just life for some of us. And there is no, 
yeah. So the, the, I mean, the, the perspectives that I bring um, in terms of, you know, my very specific POV as a queer South Asian Muslim woman has helped me to um, hone my voice in my comedic and artistic work, but mm. not without challenges, not without struggles. So at the beginning, I mentioned that you are part of uh, Second City's uh, national touring company. You recently were part of the Toronto Sketch Comedy Festival. Do you see yourself at some point uh, maybe getting your own sitcom on TV? (laughs) Or even writing for something like that? Yeah, I mean, that's the dream. Uh, Very much I think when I started doing comedy 10 years ago, I was like, I'll probably have a sitcom in 10 years. Nope. (laughs) But uh, yeah, that's the dream. That's what, that's why we wake up and we do this every day. Mm -hmm. So down the line, I'd love to have the opportunity to be a showrunner for my own show. But um, yeah, you know, got to keep working. Would you ever audition for a second for SNL? Uh, I don't have an answer for that. I think I would submit a writer's package. Mm. I don't know if I'd audition to be a performer, but I'd submit a writer's package. Mm. Yeah. So here's my last question for you. What do you hope audiences come away with once they, you know, maybe they see you on on stage at Second City? Maybe they, they see you as part of a festival. What do you hope audiences come away with once they've experienced your comedy? Your comedy stylings. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, my number one goal has always been to make people laugh. But I think I what I hope is, um, again, I being a South Asian Muslim queer woman on stage in a city like Toronto means something to me. It It matters. It matters that someone like me is up on stage. I have been um, I've heard from so many audience members uh at second city at my shows outside that you know we didn't know that that brown people did this like literally south asian people will stop me at the bar being like we can't believe you're up there where i was like yeah i know there are still so few south asian people in the arts um so for me like the I mean, it's it sounds so basic to say representation matters, but it does matter. It matters to me to have people in the audience see someone like me represented on stage, to have my opinions, my point of view, my perspectives represented. So I want audiences to see that, that you know, there are multitudes of um, people and experiences out in this world that belong in media, every form of media, and... And also to realize that we can, we're all mosaics. Like we're, we're not, none of us are just one thing. And to be able to hold all those parts of ourselves, um, whether I'm doing a comedy show at Second City or I'm doing a sketch comedy show about grief where I talk about (laughs) my mother's passing. Like there are multitudes um, in all of that. And you know, or if I'm doing my solo show where I talk about being a queer woman or being all of those things, like I want audiences to realize that we are the stories we tell. We are the stories we have and we are the stories we tell. And we have so many stories. So it's important for different stories from different perspectives to be represented. Mm-hmm. And ideally through humor, because that the, the laughter makes the bitter pill go down sweeter. <laughs> Shohana Sharman, thank you. Well said, first of all. Uh, well said, well done. Thank you for being on the show. Thanks for your time. Thanks so much. That was my spotlight on queer comedian Shohana Sharman. For more on this artist, simply visit secondcity.com. Magnus Hirschfeld made the modern homosexual. He co-founded the world's first gay rights group, the Scientific Humanitarian Committee, in Berlin in 1897. 
But what is far more important is that he and his colleagues came up with an enormously influential concept of what same-sex desire was, what it meant, and how it fit into the wider world. If you think homosexuality is an inborn quality that cannot be changed and has a biological root, but is not an illness, and if you think gay people are a sexual minority who are born that way and who deserve legal protections just as racial minorities do, you owe those ideas to Hirschfeld and a handful of others. He was among the first to articulate that conceptual model of what it means to be gay in print in 1896. We just heard professor, author, and historian of queer and trans politics, Lori Marhofer, reading from Racism and the Making of Gay Rights, a sexologist, his student, and the Empire of Queer Love, their powerful new gay history book about the man who made the modern homosexual, a German physician and sexologist who died at the age of 67 in 1935. Magnus Hirschfeld. Bill 7. To ban discrimination in employment, government services, and housing, based on a person's sexual orientation, was up for a vote at Queen's Park. Most NDP and Liberal MPPs supported the bill, but without some progressive conservative legislators backing, a divisive split could rack the province. Four PCs decided to break party ranks to vote with their conscience and support Bill 7. Cabinet Minister and MPP Dennis Timbrell did it to show solidarity for his beloved brother, the well-known drag queen Rusty Ryan. And for me, A gay politician who was not yet out, I had to take a stand. We were known as the Gang of Four. I'm former cabinet minister and MPP Phil Gillies. The date, December 2nd, 1986, when LGBT rights came to Ontario. And just like that, this little gay journey through rainbow country has come to an end. For the full two-hour episode, simply head over to marktara.com where everything is connected and hit the archives banner. To keep up to date with the show, check out my socials at marktara. The podcast is available on all major platforms. And finally, I want to take this time to thank you for taking your time to be with me. Remember, we are living in days of making dreams come true, so... Believe in yourself, and the world will believe in you. Hi, I'm Joey Lamar, best-selling author of Mambo Lips and Salsa Hips, and you're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. Mm.